I was born on January 24th, 1928 in Winstead, Connecticut, and then moved to a small town called West Heartland, Connecticut, where most of my family was from. And uh, I went to a one-room schoolhouse with, eight, with 14 students for six or eight grades, whatever it took. And then when I graduated from the one-room school, I went to a high school with 100 students. After that, I got a full scholarship to go to Yale University. And uh, I went to one year in 1945 when I was just turned 18. And then I also had been working as a forest guard for the Park and Forest Commission, so I have a great interest in trees and tree management. After I was there at Yale for a year, I became eligible to enlist in the Army, which I did, because I wanted to take advantage of a particular law which said if you went into the Army and enlisted for 18 months, you would receive three years of GI Bill coverage for college. And I wanted to enlist because there was a draft on, and later on I would have been drafted, but I wanted to enlist because I thought I'd have better control over the place I went. As it turned out, I didn't have any, but <laughs> who, who would know? So anyway, uh, I went with a bunch of other people and we all got on the train and said, we said goodbye to the family and then we went down on the train to uh, Fort Dix in New Jersey. We were processed there and we were given things like teletype uh, exercises or uh, I <clears throat> My mother had insisted that when I was in high school, I take typing. I said, I'll be there with 39 girls <laughs> learning typing with Miss Buzzy. She says, yes, you'll find it's very valuable. And indeed, she was very right. Because when they learned I could type, they said, oh, good. Well, you can be a company clerk or you could do all kinds of things. So then they sent me to the tank <laughs> section to learn about tanks. And that was, oh, three or four months in Kentucky, very hot. But it had interesting things like that. So we were marching and everybody would go, oh, come up exhausted. And we'd sit down with our backs to the barracks. And the sergeant would say, well, you do know, fellas, that that's where the Black Widow spiders live. <laughs> wow, did we ever move fast. <laughs> so after I had a week or so of rest at home, and then I got on a train and went out to Camp Stoneman in California when we were put on the, uh, the ship and sailed, as I said, for 21 days, 1,200 of us, and we were all seasick. I was very seasick along with everybody else, so the place was pretty messy. But after about a week, I got so I could eat an apple or something. But anyway, we made it to Yokohama, and they had not apparently been told that 1,200 soldiers were on their way to Yokohama. So they said, oh, really? Nobody told us. So we got there and they said, well, we don't have any food except we could give you peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Well, we gratefully accepted that. Then we stayed there for just a day or so until we were sorted out. And then I was sent down on another train several hundred miles south to Beppu Kyushu. K-Y-U-S-H-U, which is the southern large island. The one beyond it is, oh dear, uh, one of the islands in which there was a lot of fighting had taken place. Kyushu also had submarines and all kinds of other things going on there. But this was a 
created barrack setup and it had a thousand men in it and it was uh, named Camp Chickamauga. Chickamauga was a battle at the end of the Civil War which was desperately fought and won by the people in the army at Chick Chickamauga. And so the camp that we were in in Beppu was called Camp Chickamauga. And we have to revere it. There was a, lots of signs around saying this is what happened during the Civil War here and you have to uphold the honor of the, all the men who were working and fighting at Chickamauga during the Civil War. So we were constantly reminded of that. So the first thing you do when you get there is uh, you find out where the dining hall is and uh, this sort of thing. And then you're given all kinds of opportunities to tell what you know about army life. Lectures, it was high school, college, as a lot of information about how to behave in the army, what will happen if you don't, and so on. And uh, this was okay. And we started doing a lot of marching. We marched up and down, and we marched out into the bamboo forests and marched back again. The sun was pretty hot there. And a couple, in, a, in a couple of months, I came down with a sinus attack because of the kind of wet weather that was there. And they gave me sulfonilamide pills, 28 I had to take every day 28 sulfamylamide pills plus 12 charcoal pills that uh, overcame the bad effects of the sulfonilamide. I didn't get better. Then the medic said, hey, we got a new medicine that's come in from the States, never tried it before, called penicillin. Bend over. <laughs> so I got three shots in my butt. And miraculously, I was cured. But having been in bed for a couple of weeks, I could hardly walk. They gave me my rifle. It was so heavy, I couldn't, I couldn't lift it. So I went out of the hospital, discharged, carrying my rifle, and I went over to the woods, and I waited and waited until I saw my troop marching back to come home in at night after marching. So I joined him in the end. So I got better after that, but that was quite an experience. Then we had all kinds of things happening. We went all over Beppu, we marched, we found out how to fight in jungle <clears throat> areas and all kinds of things of this sort. Then, as I said, I became uh, interested in driving a truck. So I went to truck driving school, and I had always driven trucks and so on because I had two uncles who were farmers. And from the time you were six or seven, you could drive the old international trucks when they were haying because they only went in a low, low, about two miles an hour. And so if you were a kid, you could steer it and then turn it around at the end and come back. So I knew more about trucks and helped to f fix them than a lot of the other soldiers. So I went to truck driving school, and as I said, we had to go between telephone poles that were not very spacious because they didn't have big trucks. Actually, in that time, it was interesting to see the modes of transportation they had in Japan. Their taxis were uh, was powered by uh, wood stoves on the back. The back was made into a wood stove, and they heated water and provided steam, and they had a little steam engine that would make the wheels go around slowly. And that was the way they tr had transport. They didn't have gasoline or anything like that. That had all gone for the war effort. But anyway, the Japanese were very hard up 
They had very little food. So one of the things we were told, you can't go into restaurants, you can't have Japanese food because they don't have any. Just watch out for not taking the food because you got plenty at the chow of chow at our my dining hall. So we always respected that until much later when things were better then we actually uh, had some Japanese food. In the meantime, we were learning the Japanese language as rapidly as possible, particularly some of us who had to work with Japanese prisoners of war. Arigato. Thank you. Uh, Hayaku! Hurry up! <laughs> Doitashimachite. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so you picked up the language uh, pretty quickly. And also I learned the Japanese songs to sing with my guitar. That was it was not bad. And I went in the I was every Sunday, I was in the choir. We had a professional uh, chorus leader and we learned a lot of different kinds of singing and also music, which was very good for all of us because when the time came when Colonel Yancey was said, can you provide us with some groups of people who can sing and, um, and music, do music? He said, yes, we've got a Cracker Jack Chapel Choir and they can go on temporary duty for three months and uh, take in the show, the sad sack show, and they'll come in from every so often and have a, uh, a chorus with, and we're all dressed in white shirts and not in army clothes, but in the civvy clothes. And then we had that, uh, we were lined up and we would sing, Dream when the night is through. Well, anyway, uh, stateside songs and so on. We went on TDY, the temporary duty, for three months and went to, as I said, all of the different installations, uh, British, Australian, French, I don't know. We didn't go in Russian. There was a feeling about Russia that we shouldn't have too many things going on with them. So, but anyway, we did all our installations and in between we visited lots of Japanese uh, Ooh, castles and really beautiful places uh, to see. Also, uh, we got to see a lot of the different types of cities in Japan. We watched parades go by and things like that. And after the three days uh, playing before for 3,000 people, at the Ernie Pyle Theater. That was the big deal for us. Uh, then we went home. But in that time, as I mentioned before, my friend Bernie Kolosinski from Winstead, where I went to high school, and he did, he was in the press corps and he got tickets for us to see the war crimes trial. You couldn't really get them. They weren't for sale or anything, but he had press activities that he could do and he got us in as uh, visitors. So we watched uh, one day of the war crimes trials, which was quite educational. Everybody had their own earphones that would give them the language that they spoke. So we saw Tojo and Kido and, well, people we didn't really know anything about except they were monsters that had been atrocity uh, doers for our soldiers and things like that. But uh, then afterwards, as I said, we took the General Chanute big ship out of Yokohama to Hawaii, spent two days in Hawaii living on the ship and seeing the sights, Waikiki Beach, and, and drinking milk and ice, having ice cream, which we hadn't had before much and going back to the States, back to Camp Stoneman in California, and then a train back home, stopping on the way to see the Grand Canyon. And when I came home, my father gave me a big hug and a kiss. And I was so pleased because he was not demonstrative at 
mostly it was the women who were but I was so happy to be home after my time abroad.